Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you all to my talk today. And in this talk, I'm going to be discussing the major components of the Docker runtime in order for folks to understand how to leverage them within the Kubernetes platform. Uh, so I speak with a lot of folks who uh, are frustrated, deeply frustrated with Kubernetes. Uh, and a lot of that frustration stems from their lack of knowledge uh, or experience with the Docker runtime or the containers. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to try to uh, give a little bit more information about uh, Kubernetes, Docker, and that runtime, and containers. So here's a quick agenda. I'm going to briefly discuss Kubernetes. Uh, then I'm going to talk about some skill sets that I believe folks need uh, in order to be able to be successful in their endeavors with Kubernetes and Docker. And then I'm going to decompose the Docker uh, runtime a little bit, show you some of the key commands uh, and concepts within Docker that you should know. Then we're going to recap all of this. So my name is Angel Rivera. I'm a developer advocate with CircleCI. And my primarily my primary primary function within uh, as a developer advocate for CircleCI is to interact with the community and learn how people are using technology and also help them with their endeavors in technology. Right? If I have the experience or the knowledge, uh, also you know sometimes I'm actually learning with the community, so it's pretty cool um, mentoring mentee type uh, role. Uh, but uh, what I also do is bring uh, some of those learnings back to uh, CircleCI, uh, especially like the engineering and product teams. Uh, and kind of give them a heads up on how people are using technology so that they have a better understanding of um, you know, what's going on out in the industry. And then also they can build uh, more valuable, suitable, relevant tools uh, for our customers and our community. Uh, before we get into Kubernetes and Docker, I wanted to explain the term K8. I'm gonna be using it quite a bit in my presentation. And um, often I run into folks who don't understand what the K8s acronym means. And it's really simple. It's basically, if you take the first letter uh, of the word Kubernetes, which is the K, right? And then uh, the eight stands for the eight characters in between the last letter in the word Kubernetes, which is an S, right? So uh, the acronym is basically K8s. And again, uh, it's a K, then the eight characters in between the last letter, which is the S. Really simple, uh, K8s. Uh, and again, I'll be using this quite a bit in my, uh, in my presentation, which is why I wanted to touch on it real quickly. So a lot of folks often ask me, Angel, why would I use K Kubernetes or K8s? Uh, and um, I wanted to share some common reasons why if you were you know, to be looking at Kubernetes uh, really quickly with you. Uh, one reason is if you're implementing continuous integration, continuous delivery or DevOps practices, uh, Kubernetes is a great way to automate uh, some of those principles and practices that you actually have within your software development processes. Uh, it's kind of the way that, um, you know, when you're, when you're implementing something new, you need a, a tool to facilitate that. Uh, Kubernetes is, a, is an excellent platform to help you uh, with your CI, CD, and DevOps practices. Uh, so again, it'll help you build software faster and more consistently. Uh, if you want to cut costs, Kubernetes is a great option. Uh, and what I mean by costs is um, since, you know, uh, if you're running applications and straight up like a cloud provider or whatever, you would have instances of machines running and it could be, you know, quite a bit of uh, machines running at one time. Uh, and they're not being, uh, the resources are not being utilized very well. So your application is span spanning, uh, you know, multiple instances. Uh, and a lot of times what folks are doing with this is uh, pretty much creating some, some overhead, right? And they're not managing those resources well. Uh, that's where Kubernetes is actually pretty good at implementing um, resource management, right? And managing the application, uh, which helps cut costs, right? And actual effort of, as well. So not only are you cutting costs, maybe in your cloud provider, you're also cutting costs uh, in uh, translates over to maybe your system administrator's time, right? Your operations team's time. So yeah, definitely take a look at Kubernetes if you want to uh, try to cut some costs and, and save some budget. Uh, and finally, um, Kubernetes is excellent at um, being very scalable and, and providing the mechanisms for high availability. So your applications can grow and um, decrease, right? And, and, and use less resources based on the load. And Kubernetes is smart enough to know uh, when to, uh, you know, add more capabilities or reduce capabilities as well as, um, you know, share the load 
uh, of that workload uh, while the system is being used. So if you're looking for availability and scalability improvements, definitely check out Kubernetes. So let's jump into a little bit about Kubernetes and some of the key components that folks should know about uh, in order to kind of gain a better understanding of how um, containers are being run within Kubernetes. So uh, before we get into that though, I wanted to show you a definition of Kubernetes. Um, but one thing I wanted you to all uh, kind of focus in on here is, and this definition is uh, Kubernetes is an open source container orchestration system, right? Again, uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration orchestration system. So what I wanted to stress here in this in this uh, slide is, without containers, Kubernetes is pretty much not going to run anything but its own systems, right? So you have to understand um, containers, right? Uh, you have to understand how Kubernetes is basically leveraging them to provide services, right, for your applications. Like I said, otherwise, uh, if without containers, Kubernetes would just be like a standalone platform managing its own uh, services. So here's a quick a diagram about uh, the evolution of deployments, right? Back in the day when we would build applications, we would have basically an app tier system, uh, and then that would just run on hardware. And, you know, uh, the application operating system and then hardware. Uh, the problem was with this model was when we needed to scale, meaning we needed to add more resources because let's say it's a website and it became really high in demand and popular, um, we would have to add, physically add hardware, right, in order to scale, which as you can imagine is expensive and it consumes a lot of effort, right, on the team. Um, and then uh, as the industry got smarter, right, the advent of the hypervisor kind of came on the scene. And then um, that provided us a way to easily manage uh, resources on those same hardware, right? And then we can run our application instances in, in, in volume, right? So we could actually scale a little bit easier because everything's kind of was software packaged. And then the hypervisor knew how to communicate with a virtual machine and, and utilize those resources, underlying resources better. Uh, but that was still a little bit of overhead, right? And we fast forward to today where we're actually running things in a little bit smarter, again, a little bit more uh, smarter than we were with the hypervisor. Uh, and, you know, the container runtime was created. So at, at that point, the container runtime was another software layer uh, that knew how to communicate between your application um, which was isolated into what we call container, right? So you can run those applications in, in isolation. And then the runtime uh, knew how to communicate with the operating system and hardware, right? Kind of the same thing as the hypervisor, but a lot more lightweight and a lot more efficient as well. So let's talk about uh, Kubernetes and decomposing Kubernetes real quick. So what I want to do here is discuss some of the key elements of Kubernetes that I believe everyone should know uh, in order to uh, you know, be knowledgeable in the basic concepts of Kubernetes. So let's talk about uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, at the top level, a cluster, a Kubernetes cluster is basically a group of machines, right, that are running in cohesion or, or together uh, in order to provide a service, right? And, and this service, and in this case, is a Kubernetes service. So let's decompose that a little bit. Um, if you look to the left, you have what we call the control plane. And the control plane is basically the brains behind um, the, the Kubernetes cluster, right? So the control plane is managing all the other worker machines or nodes, which I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but basically you have two nodes, right? One is master and one is worker. And you can see here, this is a four cluster machine or a four machine cluster, I should say. Uh, the, the control plane is again the brains right of the whole kubernetes cluster and then the three other machines which are labeled kubernetes nodes are essentially the workhorse right of the cluster so we're going to talk about master nodes here again I'm, as i mentioned earlier right the master nodes are uh, machines in within the cluster right that can that have the control plane on them and they're controlling again uh, the 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 entire uh, cluster meaning uh, the Kubernetes services that are, that are being run, right? So Kubernetes is an amalgamation of services um, and the master node is basically where the control plane lives. And then again, it controls um, pretty much what's going on in the cluster. Like it deploys certain services to certain um, worker nodes, right? 
Uh, it also spins up and schedules uh, containers. So again, just keep in mind that the master nodes are, are a little bit different than the worker nodes because they actually are, are running the control plane, which are the brains of Kubernetes. So here's another diagram, right? Similar, um, just kind of has a little bit more services in there. Uh, and as you can see again, right, the master node has a bunch of Kubernetes related services. Uh, whereas if you look to the right and you have your Kubernetes nodes, um, you can see there, right, that they're all pretty much almost all the same. Uh, at the end of the day, they all run um, different services, right? Uh, and then, um, but one thing to note here is they all basically have pods in them, right? And they also have the container runtime, right? So the worker nodes, which are generally called the Kubernetes nodes or Kubernetes worker nodes, are, are the workhorse again. So the, yeah, as I described earlier, the worker nodes have pretty much all the, the, the processing power. Uh, they bring um, containers and pods, right? They maintain those and they actually can run your application as well. And, and you know, certain uh, amounts uh, or instances of your application. And uh, Kubernetes pods are basically, just want to touch on this, are a grouping of your actual containers. So let's say you have an application and you want to run 10 instances of that on a, in Kubernetes. A pod is just basically a, a, like a label, right? An object in Kubernetes that um, basically can you know, identify uh, or is like a label which identifies uh, the actual application. So you can have like, let's say a Node.js application pod and then you, know, you can have 10 instances within that pod. Again, it's just a way for Kubernetes to kind of keep track of specific um, application uh, deployments. And finally, we have the container runtime. So Kubernetes, as we saw in the earlier diagram, every node basically has this container runtime, right? So uh, again, uh, the reason why you must know Docker is because Kubernetes is basically based off of this concept of running your containers, right? Scheduling and running and controlling and maintaining your containers and make sure, uh, ensuring that your application is up and running at all times. So again, um, you know, the Kubernetes uh, system is very, very, very heavily dependent on uh, container runtimes, such as Docker. So let's talk about skill sets. Um, these are things that I believe uh, folks should have a foundational understanding of, right, in order to be successful when, you know, when running Kubernetes. So if you don't have continuous integration, continuous delivery, or DevOps practices in place, I suggest that you start looking into them. Um, they have basically help you deliver your software faster uh, and more consistently. They're really simple concepts, primarily cultural uh, shifts, right, within your organization or the way you uh, create software. Uh, and these are some of the benefits that you get, right? So uh, you, once you set up your practices and principles, which are kind of like your rules and guidelines of developing software, you can then start using uh, platforms um, like CircleCI and Kubernetes to uh, build, test, and deploy these, this code using automation, right? Make sure make sure developers' life's a lot easier uh, and also can bleed into, if you're talking about deployments, into your kind of your SRE teams, your sysadmins uh, as well. Yeah, uh, so, so security is really important, uh, especially in um, software development. Uh, I would definitely recommend that you look specifically at, you know, kind of learning security uh, practices as well um, across the board. But if you were talking about Kubernetes, uh, I would definitely spend some time in the role-based access controls uh, area of security um, because uh, Kubernetes heavily relies on it. And if you have a you know foundational knowledge about role-based access controls, then um, it'll be a lot easier for you to understand how Kubernetes is implementing security policies. Yeah, so networking um, again, you don't have to be a network engineer, but I, I highly suggest that you understand networking at a fundamental level, um, just because, right, obviously, uh, Kubernetes is a complex, robust system, and networking is one of the services or one of the uh, elements within Kubernetes that it controls really, really well. So as it spins up applications, it needs to know how to route traffic to those applications within the cluster, right? So again, you know, have a firm understanding of networking, um, again, just so that um, your experience with Kubernetes is a lot more pleasant, right? 
Uh, monitoring logging is really important. So if things break, you need to be able to read logs, right? And you need to know where those logs live. So spend some time in learning um, where and how logging occurs in Kubernetes. Uh, because it's uh, really important that, uh, you know, you have a way to troubleshoot the cluster and monitoring and logging is one way that you're going to be able to do that. Uh, spend some time learning how uh, Kubernetes leverages block storage uh, or, you know, any kind of persistence layer. So if you want to save data, um, you know, persistent, persist it in a, in a database or on a disk or something, uh, definitely understand how Kubernetes and uh, storage kind of uh, integrate with one another. It's a really important um, if you're trying again to save data, uh, which in most cases, eventually you will want to do that. Um, and if you have a better understanding of how, you know, the block storage works, then you'll, you'll definitely be able to do that easily. Okay, so let's talk about application programming inf interfaces. Um, basically, Kubernetes is based off of API first um, kind of concept. So I definitely recommend you get familiar with uh, APIs, uh, what they are, how to use them if you're not familiar with them already. I think most developers are. Uh, but again, I just wanted to throw that in there for people who are fairly new to, to the whole uh, Kubernetes system. Uh, YAML is really important to know as well. Um, and the reason is uh, YAML's a data structure. It's a declarative data structure. And it's been adopted by pretty much all the latest and greatest cloud native um, type projects. Uh, and we use it to um, basically control and configure Kubernetes. Uh, as well as any you know other software projects out there uh, that are recent and um, cloud native in nature, uh, so YAML is something that I think you know it's even beneficial to learn it outside of uh, Kubernetes and cloud native uh, operations or or practices. Uh, but definitely understand what YAML is and how to write YAML uh, because it will help you understand and interact with the system later on down the road. Infrastructure as code, really important as well. Uh, it enables you to codify infrastructure. So if you're you know, creating any kind of uh, resources within cloud providers, uh, you can codify those resources and then deploy them at will, right? Using the same code, it helps with consistency. It helps with um, kind of maintainability of that infrastructure. And it's really important, I think, moving forward for developers to understand uh, infrastructure as code, how to deploy it, and really maintain um, their environments with it. So definitely check out infrastructure as code. It's a skill set that will spread, or, or yeah, that will span a, 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 new, a number of different, um, I would say, uh, type uh, job types, right, or that you're trying to do, or the different roles in your career. And finally, have a deep understanding, right? If you're gonna if you're gonna work with Kubernetes, you obviously need a deep understanding of containers. Um, and hopefully I'll sh point out the, what well, my goal here today is to point out the, the, uh, more critical pieces of containers, right? So let's take a look at Docker. Um, what is Docker? What, 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 what exactly is it? It's basically a runtime that enables you, uh, to run your applications in containers on pretty much any platform out there, right? So, um, as a developer, the way it works is um, you just package your application up into what we call a Docker image, and then you're able to then spawn uh, instances, running instances of that image, right, which are called containers. Um, so let's talk about um, Docker and go into some of the major points of Docker. So let's talk about the Docker engine, which is equivalent to the Docker runtime, right? So Docker runtime, Docker engine, same thing, uh, just different terminology. Um, real quick, Here's a diagram of the Docker engine. Uh, what I'm gonna to be touching on today are the Docker build bits, um, the uh, networking, I'm gonna show a demonstration with a quick networking uh, bit to it, and then uh, the orchestration bit, as well as uh, the Docker CLI. So Docker images, real quick explanation of Docker images. I like to use a cookie cutter um, example uh, or definition. Uh, and basically what's happening there is Docker is, uh, if you look at a Docker image, I would equate it to the cookie cutter. And let's say you have a rolled out, you know, some dough and you wanna create 10 cookies. The Docker image is basically gonna be the way that you define the shape and form of your container. So if you were down to press down uh, with your, doc your cookie cutter uh, on, the, on the dough, you would create cookies. And if you did that 10 times, you would have 10 cookies. So imagine the Docker image again is just a, the, defining the shape and form and the operation of your, of your actual container. So when you go to deploy a container, 
uh, it's based off of that Docker image, right? So they should all be the same unless you change it using the Docker run command, which I'll show you a little bit later. But again, um, the, the cookie cutter is the Docker image and then the cookies that you cut with that cutter are containers, equivalent to containers. So the, the way that you would build an image, right? So you would always have to start with building an image uh, is using the Docker build command. And, um, and when you're building that Docker build command, you have to define it in a Docker file. So a Docker file is basically, and here's an example of it, is uh, the, basically the specification, right, for your image. Uh, it defines where you're gonna inherit from. So do the way Docker works is you can inherit um, an image, right? You can inherit from an image, an existing image, and then uh, extend that uh, basic image, right? So in this case, what we're doing here is we're extending from a Node.js 12, version 12 image, and then we're just copying our, our application code there. Uh, then we're going to run an npm install, which installs um, the code and dependencies into the container. And then I'm going to copy the rest of the source code over. And then I'm, ex I'm defining a port 5000 exposure, as well as the final command, which is actually starting the application when the container is uh, instantiated, right? Really simple, um, but this is basically a Docker file and how you would use it. Very important when you're building your own custom images, right? So let's take a quick demo of the Docker build command. Okay, so I have a terminal here, and now I'm going to show you how to build a Docker container off from a Docker file. So let's go ahead and first, you know, in, in, when you wanna see if you have any images installed or, you know, want a list of images that are installed on the local machine, you would type Docker images. And right now we have nothing, right? So let's go ahead and build a Docker, um, container or Docker image based off of our Docker file in our project. So I have a Docker file uh, when you want to use the Docker build command. And then what you want to do is give it a tag or a name. And what we're going to name ours is a Rivera, which is based off of my hub.docker account. Uh, and then I'm going to call it a, let's just call it Node.js, right? Uh, and then we'll call it circle CI because I use this quite a bit in my build, build pipelines. Now, the last thing you want to do here is a dot. Docker is smart enough to know that the default file is Docker file. Uh, but if you want to give it a name uh, specifically or a different file name, you can do that. But you, then you would have to use the file tag or the file uh, flag here. And what we're going to do is just use the regular one. But the most important thing here is always have that dot. The dot is what, you know, uh, tells the system that to look, you know, where to look. And it's going to be in that absolute folder there. So go ahead and start running. As you can see, it's gonna download. And what I'm gonna do is um, stop this real quick and come back when it's done, because it takes a Okay, great. So now we have our Docker image built, right? And now we can see it. Um, so let's run our, our, our Docker images command again. And now we have, uh, you can see that, you know, my new Docker image has been created 20 seconds ago. Uh, and now we can actually deploy this thing. Um, so yeah, this is really easily how you can build a Docker image. Um, and now let's talk about, uh, go back to our slides. All right, great. So now that we've covered uh, building a Docker image, let's go ahead and talk about Docker containers, right? Which are basically spawns of the Docker image, like I said earlier, right? So if you have a cookie cutter, you cut some cookies, those cookies that you just cut are spawned from that uh, cookie cutter, right? So that that in, in terminology of, of or in, in instance of uh, Kubernetes and Docker, uh, those are called containers, which are the runnable bits, right, of your application. This is what you package up your application to an image, and then you can start deploying these instances of that application within containers. So yeah, the way that you instantiate or create containers is through the Docker run command. Um, which I'm going to demo for you right now. So let's clear this out and create a new container. Actually, let's just leave it and we'll create a new container based of our new, our new, uh, our new Docker image. So the first thing is, right, I said Docker run is a key component that you need to understand and learn. Um, and then we're going to say a Rivera. Whoa. <laughs> and then uh, it's node. JS dash circle CI. And 
Okay, great. So we have the image name in there. But first, we want to give it a dash D, which makes it run in the background as a daemon, right? So you don't have to really worry about it. it just kicks it off as a, as a daemon. Uh, the next step is adding a port. Since it's a web app, we need access to, to the container uh, or to the application. So we're going to open up a port here. And so just going to use a default port 5000. And this is a NAT, right? So you want to use 5000 and then 5000 again. So that's the ingress and then uh, the translation to the port on internally into the container or to the application, I should say. Uh, so then we just have to give it a name. So this is the container name, right? And we're going to call this test zero one. So I believe we have all the bits that we need to get this container up and running. Let's send the command. And yeah, it should be running. So the way you would check right to see if you have any active running containers is Docker Docker PS. Docker and then PS dash a and there you go. Uh, as you can see, we have a container that's running. It was created 17 seconds ago. It's been up for 14 seconds and it has a port of 5000, right? So let's go ahead and here's the name of that. Um, let's go ahead and test um, the application, right? Um, so let's go ahead and jump over to a browser and see if my container is actually running. So it's UB Docker. It's my server name and 5000. And sure enough, we have the application running on port 5000 on that server in a container, which is awesome, right? Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you real quick. So let's say, you know, you have this container, it's up and running, but you want to stop it, right? So again, you just go through Docker uh, run and oh, it's disregard this Docker stop. And then you give it the name, which was test zero one was the name of the container, right? So we hit that command and we should go back to our site. And if we do a, a, a refresh on the web page, uh, the server is dead, right? Or because the container is gone. But if I go back, and this is another command that you should learn, and we say Docker start, really simple, right? You can actually start that container up again and have it running fully. So if we go back and then we do a refresh again, we should have our application up and running, right? So see, you literally, you're just controlling that container, which is controlling the application. It's being, it's going up and down. And then you can control the network bits. Uh, so uh, let's go back to our slide deck. Um, now that you've seen a demonstration of Docker run, um, I wanted to show you, uh, talk about container deployments, right? So imagine if you, you know, this is all running locally on my server, but if you were to, to deploy this to Kubernetes, that's exactly what you would get. And then Kubernetes would be actually um, running this and controlling uh, how many instances of it, right? So that's the beauty of Kubernetes as a platform is you're able to kind of, you know, deploy a, what we call a configuration to it. And then um, it's a container deployment configuration. And you can tell it like, I need to run 10 instances of Kubernetes at all times, right? Or you can say run 10 until a threshold is set or, or hit. Like maybe there's a lot of uh, network traffic going on, right? And you have some, some solid uh, thresholds. And once they exceed those thresholds, Kubernetes can deploy maybe another 5% more or maybe even five containers. Depending on how you want to increment that, uh, you, can, you can basically program Kubernetes to do so. So, yeah, in order for us to, uh, you know, have a deeper understanding uh, of Kubernetes, you definitely have to go ahead and do some research on your own. Uh, but I want to recap some of the things that I talked about today. Uh, definitely about uh, images, right? And here's some commands that you should look at, right? Initially to, to have a deep understanding of containers and images. Um, these are simple commands. Um, they're nothing really hard here. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I definitely suggest that you take a look at uh, all of these commands because these are going to be the important ones that you're going to be using day in, day out when, in, your, in your Docker journey as well as your Kubernetes journey. Um, also, I wanted to recap on containers, right? Uh, here again, there are a list of commands that you should be uh, looking at and understanding thoroughly uh, because they're going to be really important um, in, in your education, right, of, of, of Docker and your experience with Docker. Uh, these commands are going to be the ones that you're going to be using quite a bit as well in the Docker run sense. So please um, understand um, the container commands that are out there. And of course, right, touch on the skill sets real quick. I just wanted to make sure that folks understand that 
you know, um, these skill sets that I'm showing you here, again, are going to be super helpful if you have a, 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 a fundamental understanding of every topic on this slide. Um, and if you don't, um, you can always hit me up at Punk Data. I can help you with that as well. I'm more than happy to, to you know, guide folks in, in the direction that they need and help them with any kind of resources. Also, here's some resources um, that are that were really helpful to me and uh, continue to be helpful as well. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out here is, you know, the Docker documentation site is really well done. I really like um, the way they lay out the, the content about Docker and you can learn a lot more about it there. Uh, also, um, Micro K8 is a is a Kubernetes type system. So if you want to like a development environment, if you want to run that locally, you can and you know, it doesn't cost you very much as far as uh, resources. So definitely look into, um, you know, building containers, and then you can actually uh, test out deploying uh, to like a micro eights with development environment so that you know, you don't have to stand up all this complicated stuff, you just run it from your laptop. And then finally, definitely check out the community uh, documentation or do the community section of the Kubernetes website. It will provide you quite a bit of resources as well in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So I believe that's it. Um, I hope that folks have learned quite a bit about uh, Docker at the runtime and why it's important to um, understand Docker and, and, and containers uh, when you're trying to adopt Kubernetes. Uh, if you again, if you have any questions, or if you you know want to talk about this a little bit more, uh, you can hit me up at Punk Data on my Twitter handle down below there in the slide, and I'll be more than happy to have conversations with everyone.